is a called Race and the Labor Movement. It will be led by Tanya Wallace Goburn, who is the executive director of the National Black Worker Center Project. Um, and so we'll be dealing with that. And we are scheduled to go until 3, until 5 p.m. Um, we probably may not use all of that time, but just in case, and we'll make sure we won't go any further past that. Um, this entire uh, webinar will be recorded, and we can send it to you as well, just to let you know. And we will have um, quest time for questions. Uh, Tanya has broken down her presentation into three specific sections, and uh, that at certain points when she stops, she'll ask a question. Uh, we can ask those. Uh, everyone is on mute, so if you look at your panel, the GoToWebinar control panel, on the right, you'll see a question for a section for questions. What you'll do is type into that section, and then I will, uh, once we have the time, so you can throughout the presentation type any question you have, and then once we get to the question time, I will uh, say the question to Tanya, and then from there, we will, um, we can get into the question and answer portion. Um, just a moment. So Okay, I think we're just trying to move right now to, so I can show Tanya's uh, screen. She has a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so I think everyone should see Tanya's screen now, and what I'm going to go ahead and do is pass it on over to her, and now, Tanya, you can go ahead. Thanks, Ben, and I wanted to say thank you to you and to Jobs with Justice for inviting me to host this webinar. Thank you to everyone who has participated today and is listening in. To those folks that are on the East Coast, I hope you're somewhere warm and not too bogged down um, by the snow. So I'm thinking um, what I'd like to do today is to, to, as Ben said, I've broken down this discussion in, into three parts, but I think I'll start off with just doing a bit of in, introduction um, about our organization, the National Black Worker Center Project, um, and myself, and then the three parts uh, the discussion I have is um, around the history of blacks and unions, the challenges that blacks and unions have faced, and our current state, and where do we go from here. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the National Black Worker Center Project, our mission is to support and incubate black worker centers that empower black workers to advance their rights and improve the quality of jobs in key employment sectors. So we provide education about the, the impacts of um, low wage and unemployment on black community, and we prevent racial discrimination in hiring and other employment practices. The National Black Worker Center Project utilizes a combination of leadership development, organizing, policy advocacy, strategic communications to build power to address the black job crisis. Currently, we have affiliates and are and are or incubating affiliates in Los Angeles, the Bay Area, Chicago, Boston, Mass, Washington, D.C., the Raleigh Rocky Mount Corridor of North Carolina, Baltimore, and in St. Louis. We believe that the Black Worker Center um, or Black Worker Activism and the 21st century must be focused on organizing for power, not just delivering services to individuals. We believe that um, a broader community uplift and not just gaining individual achievement is necessary for our collective strength and success. Um, we also um, are very strong advocates of collective action and not just individual action. One of the things that I would say that uh, we strive to do at the National Black Worker Center Project is to not be another organization that 
grows and recruits more members. Rather, we see ourselves as being an organization that grows and develops leaders. Um, so if you're not familiar with the organization, you might want to get a better understanding of how we do our work. Um, primarily, it's done by organizing workers to fight for quality jobs, primarily African-American workers. And when you think of, um, for those of you that have union experience, when you think of um, what it's like to, to join a, a union or form an organizing committee, um, frequently, you know, the, the thought is that you don't wait until you have permission from the National Labor Relations Board or you win your election or you have your first contract to start acting like a union. The day that you decide that you will stand up in your workplace is the day that you have a, a union. And so similar to that, that principle and philosophy, at the Black Worker Center, we create worker committees. And so while we don't have the same protections as, um, as organized labor, and we definitely are not unions, we do believe that workers have the, the innate power to, to stand up for themselves, their, their rights, and their working conditions, and we do that through working committees. I want to give you an example of um, some other work that we've done recently in the Bay Area. So last year in June of 2016, as a part of the Justice Reinvestment Coalition, our Bay Area Worker Center celebrated a victory that we're really proud of that will result in 1,400 quality jobs for Alameda County residents who have criminal records. The county program is called Reentry Hiring. And so through outreach in black communities, the Bay Area Black Worker Center learned that almost 80% of black people in Oakland either themselves had been incarcerated or had a family member who was or had previously been incarcerated. And residents expressed that having a criminal record was one of the biggest reasons why they found it difficult to keep or to find a quality job. And so due to legislative advances, um, Alameda uh, County's criminal justice system um, has increased, like it has over um, um, in, in many other different counties and cities across this country. Um, and we've learned that without gainful employment, um, formerly incarcer incarcerated people are, are likely to re-enter the system. And so people who have convictions or even arrests without conviction face enormous barriers to employment that you all are probably familiar with. So as a result of the Bay Area Black Workers Center's campaign in Alameda County, the Board of Supervisors voted unanimously last June in 2016 to create a program that will hire formerly incarcerated residents throughout the country. So in fact, what we are we call it like our, our 1,400 success because we were able to, for 1,400 um, previously incarcerated um, felons, identify 1,400 quality jobs. And so this initiative calls for a best practice model, if you will, to provide job coaching, job mentors, co court advocates, um, support to take the civil service exam for county jobs, and building um, a really successful employment model in, in the county. And so we are very proud of that work. Um, it's been modeled after some work, um, a Jobs Now program that was created in San Francisco. Um, and so we think that this is, this is a good example of the ways that we seek out quality employment um, for African Americans. This program, this reentry hiring program, is the first of its kind in the nation, and it's focused on hiring, um, the affirmative hiring of people who struggle to find employment because of having a record. And so I wanted to share that with you as an example of the, the types of work that we, we do in our black worker centers. So um, I want to also give you a sense of, of who I am. Again, my name is Tanya wallace Goldburn. I'm the executive director for the National Black Worker Center Project, and I have been in the labor movement since 1992. I was a graduate of the second class of the Organizing Institute, which is a training program that the AFL-CIO puts on to train people to become um, union organizers. I was recruited from my college campus and wanted to organize women and people of color primarily. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, and 
for me that meant that I relocated to the South to organize in the clothing and textile workers industry. So um, um, I, I say that to, to give you a sense of my, my experience and know that my background, for those of you who are, are in unions, know that my heart, my, my, my blood, everything that I do really comes from a perspective of workers um, struggle for, for dignity, respect, decent wages and benefits. That, that's who I am and work that I'm proud of having done in my past and continue to do with the National Black Worker Center Project. I want to also share a bit of who I am not. So I'm not a historian, I'm not a, a labor studies expert or race relations guru. I, you know, I, I would say that I'm a person who observes and has opinions on what I see and I think that that's true for all of us. And so um, in, in preparing for this presentation, I wanted to encourage you all to, to comment on what you've seen in your communities or in the labor movement, comment on what you've heard and what you know, because I think that it is in that type of a sharing that we, we tend to learn and grow. And that is my hope for, for this discussion today, that we all learn and grow a little bit more and stretch a little bit more than we have in the past. So to get started, I wanted to start off by taking you down um, a timeline of unions or blacks and unions. When I think about the history of blacks and unions, it begins with white unions' refusal to allow blacks to join in their ranks. And so as you can imagine, in response to this refusal, Blacks joined their own organization. In December 1869, the Colored National Labor Union was formed by 214 black mechanics, engineers, artisans, tradesmen, and tradeswomen in pursuit of equal representation for African Americans in the workforce. The organizer and first president of the organization was a guy named Isaac Myers. Um, a name that you might be more familiar with is um, the civil rights activist Fred, Fred, Frederick excuse me, Douglass, who was selected as the press second president of the um, CNLU in 1872. The thing that's interesting to point out about um, this, this union is that all workers, no matter what race, gender, or occupation, were welcomed. In that same year of 1869, the Knights of Labor began a secret society of tailors in Philadelphia. The organization grew slowly, but in, by the 1870s, mili um, militancy around um, of the workers rose by the end of that decade, and after the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, the Knights' membership rose greatly. By 1886, the group had 700,000 members, and they, you know, got rid of the, the earlier rules of secrecy and committed the organization to seeking um, eight-hour workdays, abolishing child labor, um, creating equal pay for equal work, and political reforms, including um, the graduated income tax. Unlike most trade unions of the day, the Knights Union was vertically organized, um, and each included all workers in a given industry, regardless of their trade. The, the Knights were also unusual in the fact that they accepted workers of all skill levels, both sexes, and ethnicity, all ethnicities. And so um, after 1883, blacks were included in the union, although they were part of segregated locals. In 1881, Samuel Gompers organized the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions of the United States of America and Canada. This union um, has become what we know as the AFL. So by 1886, the AFL became the largest labor union in the United States. It started off with, um, the AFL started off with a non-discrimination policy, but its founder, Samuel Gompers, later developed this fear that black workers would take whites' jobs, and that fear has haunted the labor movement for generations. At that particular moment in time, only skilled workers were allowed to join um, the union, and women, blacks, and other racial minorities were prohibited. During the Great Migration of 1916 to 1930, 
Over one million blacks moved from the South to the North in search of better lives. It's estimated that 400,000 left the South during the two-year period of 1816 to 1818 to take advantage of a labor shortage that was created in the wake of the First World War. Blacks made significant gains in industrial employment, particularly in steel, um, automobiles, shipbuilding, and the meatpacking industry. Between 1910 and 1920, the number of blacks employed in industry doubled from 500,000 to 901,000. In 1922 to 1923, there were upheavals in the coal mining industry caused by the end of the war. And I point this out because the United Mine Workers of America at that point was light years ahead of any of the, any of the other AFL unions in that they organized black miners. Despite fundamental ideas of black inferiority, um, solidarity amongst miners of all colors and nationalities was, was, well, um, was well discussed and known. In 1925, A. Philip Randolph began his 12-year fight to gain recognition of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters by the Pullman Car Company, the AFL Labor Union, and the U.S. government. And as we know, Randolph ultimately was successful in his quest by 1937. In 1933 to 1938, President Roosevelt Franklin and his New Deal sought to alleviate Great Depression, suffering unemployment, and to increase purchasing power. New Dealers sought to institute the collective bargaining process by guaranteeing labor the right to organize and to um, designate representatives for collective bargaining processes or purposes underneath the National Labor Relations Board. Black leaders were disappointed that the Wagner Act of 1935 did not contain prohibitions against union race discrimination. In 1930, no more than 50,000 out of 1,500,000 black workers engaged in transportation and the extraction of metals or metals and minerals were members of any type of trade union. The conservative AFL at that time showed little to no interest in organizing blacks and white or, and any interest in organizing black laborers in mass production industries. And to this day, a large number of unions, and at that point rather, a large number of unions still did not extend membership to blacks. And so as a result of that, a number of Union presidents got fed up with the refusal, the refusal of the American Federation of Labor to organize unskilled and semi-skilled factory workers, and they found the Committee for Industrial Organization in 1935. The committee formalized its break with the AFL when it first held its convention in 1938, and it renamed itself the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The CIO sought to organize industrial workers regardless of race or ethnic background. Doing so greatly contributed to alleviating the historic conflict between African Americans and trade unions. Thousands of African American workers joined the CIO unions, as you can imagine. And it wasn't until 1955 that the two unions reunited together as the AFL-CIO. For the remainder of the 20th century, the AFL-CIO remained the largest union in the United States. And the rest, as they say, is history. So I'm going to stop here and see if anyone has any um, comments or questions that they'd like to ask. Ben, do you have anything? Uh, yes, there are three questions here. Let's see. So the first question is, uh, does the role of the National Black Worker Center Project shift or change given our current political climate and rise of anti-union sentiments? So, so that's a really good question, and, and we would say no, our priorities do not change. Our priorities has always been to, to mobilize black workers to, to, and to organize black workers for power, particularly in the workplace. And when you look at the current political climate, um, 
I would say that now is, is more than ever is our is our time and is our opportunity and the necessity is for 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 black workers to to walk into and to, to own their power. The um, I think that you know one of the challenges that we see in this country is uh, is the division um, amongst um, amongst the races or the racism and an unwillingness to discuss it. And the, the at the National Black Worker Center project, we um, are, are honest with ourselves and we say that we hold the line, if you will. Um, black workers in this country have been the the, the testing ground for discrimination um, against all workers, right? And so if we are not successful in, in pushing back against the machine, if you will, then that opens the floodgates for the discrimination, the harassment, the low wages, the, the you name it, all of the isms for everyone else that, that comes behind us. And so we um, cannot change our agenda. If anything else, we must step up and we must partner with more organizations so that they understand and agree that this is a priority for, for our country and for the labor movement. Okay, good answer. Um, the other question is, uh, I guess a couple smaller ones. Can you repeat the name of the San Francisco program, Jobs for the Formerly Incarcerated, you just mentioned? Sure, um, so it's, it's part of the Justice Reinvestment Coalition um, it's the Bay Area Black Worker Center Project. Okay. All right. And do you have the timeline uh, available, like on text for sharing that you gave out? Yes, I can. I'll, I can um, forward that to you, Ben, um, after the call, if you like. You can okay. send it out. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Well, that, that was um, that was all of the questions that we have so far. Okay, great. Those are some, some good questions. Yeah, so you can continue the next section, I suppose, now okay. then. Great, thank you. So I would say that the idea of unions is based on or in solidarity of workers. And I would submit to you that without a deeper understanding of workers beyond their jobs, the notion of innate worker solidarity is nothing more than a romanticized myth. Workers are people. They're men and women, young and old, underemployed and well compensated, native born and immigrant. They're lesbian, heterosexual, bisexual, transgendered, homosexual, they're Asian and Latino, and they're white and black. And these individual workers and groups of workers have widely varying economic interests. In the labor movement with the election of Trump, there have been conversations about workers voting against their self-interest, as if some voice from on high declared a one-size-fits-all worker interest definition. What I believe is true for most workers is that they've suffered and that their lives have grown more insecure. From workers whose jobs have been eliminated or outsourced to workers who fear police encounters going to and from work, for the workers who are herded into low-paying, exploitative jobs, workers who have tasted the American dream pie and cling so tightly to that piece while the rest of the pie is gobbled up by the 1%. Black workers in particular have and are, as best they can, are being tasked with promoting their individual and collective well-being in a hostile economic and social environment. As to be expected, in light of that, um, the harsh union discrimination and at best an indifferent government, historically blacks have disagreed amongst themselves regarding the best strategy to fulfill their collective self-interest. Two, self, two such strategies that I'd like to share with you are um, one, a I think that we're familiar with one, um, a competitive labor market in which blacks can compete without fear of being shut out by whites, and two, opposition to laws from blacks that prohibited courts from upholding the right to strike. An example um, of support for a competitive labor, uh, a competitive labor market in which blacks can compete without fear of being shut out by whites is um, found in W.E.B. Du Bois' attempts to find common ground with the unions. 
And so um, for those of you who don't know, um, W.E.B. E. Du Bois, excuse me, was one of the most important social thinkers of his time. Um, he is known for publishing um, a, a book entitled The Souls of Black Folk, um, and most other people may know that he uh, know him because he was one of the founding officers of the NAACP. So in, in March 1918, Du Bois wrote, I am among the few colored men who have tried conscientiously to bring about understanding and cooperation between American Negroes and the labor unions. I have sought to look upon the sons of freedom as simply as a part of great ma as a part of the great mass of the earth's disinherited, and to realize that the world movements which have lifted the lowly in the past are opening the gates of opportunity to them today, and they are now of equal value for all men, white and black, then and now. I carry on the title page, for instance, of this magazine. The union label, and then the magazine. Um, just so you guys know that he's referring to is the Crisis Magazine, which is a magazine that the NLAC, um still puts out today. I carry on the title page, for example, of this magazine, the union label, and yet I know, and every one of my Negro readers know, that the very fact that this label is there is an advertisement that no Negro hand is is engaged in the printing of this magazine since the International Typographical Union systematically and deliberately excludes every Negro that it dares from membership, no matter what its quali his qualifications. I have, therefore, inveighed against color discrimination by employers and by the rich and well-to-do, knowing at the same time in silence that it is particularly impossible for any colored man or woman to become a boiler maker or bookbinder, an electrician, a, a glassmaker, a worker in jewelry or leather, a machinist, a metal polisher, a paper maker or piano builder, a plumber or potter, a printer or a pressman, a telegrapher or a railway track man, an electrotyper or a stove mounter, a textile worker or a towel layer, a trunk maker, a poster carpenter, locomotive engineer, switch man, stone cutter, baker, blacksmith, booth, shoemaker, tailor, or any of a dozen other important well-played employments without encountering open determination and unscrupulous opposition of the whole United Labor Movement of America. And this is for someone who was in support of incorporating or, or integrating labor unions. And I, I read that one as just as a, um, an example of how strong that conflict must have been. An example of opposition to laws that prohibited courts from upholding the right to strike can be found um, in, um, I'm sorry, I'm not um, keeping up my PowerPoint can be found um, in the, the quandary that we think of when someone crosses a picket line. And so when you think of people that cross a picket line, who are they, right? They're scabs. They're among the worst villains of traditional labor history. They're strike breakers. And as strike breakers, they're portrayed as dupes of greedy capitalists and at worst, you know, depicted as, as Judases or evil scabs who trade their laboring brothers and class interests for short-term gains. In the new, in the pre-New Deal period, however, blacks were found disproportionately in the ranks of strike bearers. For blacks, strike breaking in the pre-New Deal era was a way of entering advancing industries otherwise closed to them by union discrimination. Although labor historians often asserted that strike-breaking blacks were dismissed, once the strikes ended, this outcome was routine only when the strike was successful, and the victorious union could demand the strike-breaker's dismissal. However, when the employer emerged victorious, 
they frequently retain the blacks hired as strike breakers and having broken the color line previously imposed by the white workers continued to hire blacks thereafter. Black strike breakers in short were neither grossly naive or evil, but I suggest they took advantage of a labor of take advantage of labor market opportunities otherwise that were closed off to them by prejudice. This practice and so-called interest to protect American work the American workforce against competition from underpaid labor imported by unscrupulous employers is fault if not foolish. It's a stupid strategy that haunts us today when we seek to exclude migrant workers. Of course, um, employers did capitalize on racial divisions by recruiting black workers as strike breakers. In a 1917 incident, employers in East St. Louis, Illinois recruited Southern blacks to take jobs for low pay to drive down wages. White workers organized a white-only union in response. Racial tensions mounted, and in July, an attempt to drive blacks from their neighborhoods led to a riot in which 40 blacks and nine whites were killed. The AFL craft unions became solid, solidly racist. And in 1902, W.E.B. Du Bois found that 43 national unions had no black members, and 27 others bare blacks from being apprentices, keeping membership to a minimum. Du Bois spoke out against both the practice among employers of importing in ignorant Negro and American laborers in emergencies and the practice of labor unions of prescribing and boycotting and opposing thousands of their fellow toilers. It should be clear that the policies of the unions were self-defeating. By refusing to admit blacks, they were assume, assuring that there remained a group of workers that employers could turn to in order to bring down wages or to apply pressure during strikes. It wasn't until later in the 20th century that union leaders began to look beyond their own prejudice to see that solidarity across racial lines made sense. In fact, it's the emergence of the CIO in 1955 that created this hope for a racially equitable labor movement. And as we know, eventually blacks did find place in unions. Industrial unions and the CIO were among the most integrated organizations in American society during the 1930s. For example, it would have been virtually impossible to organize the steel industry while ignoring 85,000 black steel workers. CIO members addressed each other as brother and sister, irregardless or regardless of race. In 1941, black workers who made up 20% of the labor force in the Ford River Road plant in Dearborn, Michigan, were faced with a dilemma. Ford had catered to blacks, hiring many in at good wages and hoping to turn them into loyal allies against unionization. The United Auto Workers was calling a strike to win recognition from the company. The black workers made their decision. They decided to join the strike and help to turn it into a success. By 1945, more than 500,000 African-American members were members of CIO unions. More unions broke down racial barriers after World War II. Um, uh, you know, actually, before I go into that, I want to say one other thing. So I mentioned earlier that I moved from Chicago to the South, and that, um, that tact of, uh, tactic of trying to pit worker against worker was something that we saw um, frequently in the South, um, primarily with businesses moving to the southern part of the country in order to escape the unions in, in the North and, and by um, paying white workers wages higher than black workers to kind of pit them against each other. And I, I just, I just, that came to my mind because it's kind of the reverse of what we saw happening in 1941. So as I was saying, um, more unions broke down racial barriers after World War II. Because of the labor movement, the industrial workplace became democratized for blacks before the rest of society. And so schools remained segregated and many blacks were denied the right to vote 
but under a union contract, blacks were treated like other workers. They no longer had to show deference to their employers or worry about arbitrary dismissal. And as a result, black workers became solidly pro-union and were among the largest groups most likely to be unionized during the 1950s, and this is still to get the case today. Partly out of necessity, I think unions have generally proven to be somewhat more accommodating to blacks than society as a whole. And though blacks often had to fight to join unions, they also found the labor movement could do much to help them win advances in their condition and status, so much so that we see um, black political activists who have modeled their civil rights activism and um, the, the, the practice of groups' rights demonstrated by union pioneers. I, I, I want to put a, um, a footnote here and say that it's important to, to um, an, an important reason as to why unions discriminated black, um, against blacks, I think, is that because they themselves served as a sort of a, um, uh, they served as social as a social function, similar to maybe like a private club. Um, white union workers were refused to allow blacks into their unions because their own social status would decline if they associated with blacks, and because mixing with blacks would imply a degree of social e equality between them that most whites destructively refused to acknowledge then and even today in some circumstances. I believe that this refusal to acknowledge equality between the races shows up today and an, and an unwillingness to meaningfully address or flat out ignore blacks' broader social and economic problems or even deal with them meaningfully. In fact, I would submit that our country has not moved past the age of inequity. At the, Black, um, the National Black Workers Center project, we assert that we have unfinished business with unions and an un honest, open dialogue and action is sorely needed to, sorely needed to close this loop. I think because of the history of racism in unions, we tend to want to shy away from discussing the elephant in the room. We call each other brother and sister. We, we say we don't see color. We carry on as if we're all the same. But to not see color is to not see the experience, the pain, or the person. We have done so much work to be the same that now some unions are worried about divis divisiveness. So much so that some unions have shielded or shied away from addressing police violence. But when the union is silent um, on an issue that is so crucial to black members, I would say that also threatens union cohesive cohesion. So we can't, um, you know, in this moment in time, not have this conversation without talking about Black Lives Matter and how unions are relating to the, the movement. And I want to start off with um, some good examples of, of what's going on across the country. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with um, the Chicago Teachers Union, but it's a, it's a very large and strong and powerful union, and frequently when you hear about it, it's about them going on a strike. It's like they're just always in, in battlements with the with the city and the with the city and the mayor. The, I, I'm raising um, and lifting up the Chicago Teachers Union because they partner with Black Lives Matter to build an even bigger movement in support of. The, the challenges and struggles that the teachers were going for, through. Um, the Chicago Teachers Union realized that a good way to boost their numbers and power is to, is to partner with people who are organizing in other ways. They are building a broader movement as we build our unions and to support our unions. So historically, um, for several years, the Teachers Union put um, incredible effort into building unit, unity, not only amongst its membership, but with parents and neighborhood groups. One of the vehicles that they used was the Chicago Teacher Solidarity Campaign. And this um, solidarity campaign is an alliance of a dozen um, unions, community, 60 community organizations, which included Chicago chapters of Black Lives Matter and Black Youth Project 100 because many members of the Black Lives Matter in Chicago chapter 
had either worked um, or been a student of the Chicago public school system or had partners who worked for the Chicago public school system, the membership already understood why public schools were worth fighting for. Um, a Black Lives Matter chapter leader was quoted as saying, and talking about um, a man named Ronald Johnson who was killed by the police um, about two years ago, so that would have been in 2014. Mr. Johnson had five children, all of whom were, were Chicago public school students. They're currently in the care of their grandmother who lives in poverty, and that family is directly impacted by the tax on public education in the city of Chicago. The layoff of 1,000 teachers and the plan to hire 1,000 more cops was a clear example of the divestment in our communities, in the black community in Chicago. In the run-up to um, the possible strike, um, the Black Lives Matter chapter spearheaded organizing a freedom school to offer parents a safe place to send their kids while teachers were out on the picket line. Another good example of working uh, well together happened in the, the state of Wisconsin. Now, many of us know that the state of Wisconsin already had some of the worst racial disparities in the country when Governor Scott Walker took office. Soon after he took office, he defunded a program that tracked the race of people stopped by police, even though black residents of Madison Dane County were found to be more than 97 times more likely to go to jail for a drug crime than a white resident. The governor's new budget proposed an $8 million jail expansion in Dane County, and at the same time, social services, as you can imagine, because this is going on across the country, were being eliminated. Governor Walker signed a so-called right-to-work bill into law, and the police killings of Tony Robinson led to marching in the street. Demonstrators included civil rights groups and union leaders. These groups rallied around not just holding responsible um, the, the officer for the killing, but demanding a shift in priorities for the entire state. Some labor unions leaders say, have said in Wisconsin that the failure to build these bridges in the past hurt the labor movement in Wisconsin and hurt Wisconsin's progress overall. Michael Below with um, the Teachers Assistance Association was quoted as saying, if unions are going to have any future or meaningful impact in the state going forward, they're going to need to build these coalitions and advocate for justice outside as well as inside of the workplace. So I would um, add that the, the, the success of labor is dependent on its willingness to get involved in a broader political movement for working people. The vast majority of the working class is not organized by unions. But working people are disproportionately people of color, and racism and police brutality have a major impact on our lives and their lives. If the unions are going to grow and to stay powerful, they have to support the broader interests of working people, and that includes the black freedom struggle. Social justice can't just be an issue for black union members. If we as a movement don't ensure that the most marginalized among us has justice, the rest of us won't as well. If we don't move together as a collective, we won't be strong. And, and when, I, when I think about this time that we're in right now and how we got here, I'm reminded of a quote from um, James Baldwin in his um, 1970 open letter to Angela Davis after she was arrested. And, and most of you may know the last part of this um, quote, but I'm going to read just two sentences of it for you. If we know then we must fight for your life as though it was our own, which it is, and render it impassable with our bodies the corridor to the jazz cha gas chamber. For if they take you in the morning, they will come for us at night. If they take you in the morning, they will come for us at night. That's where I think we are right now. We've gotten very comfortable in, in saying that this is happening to them. Even in the labor movement, 
when we look at other workers who don't have unions and who are struggling with, with no benefits and no pension and no retirement and no health insurance and, and poor wages and being treated like shit and crap on the job, that is happening to them. But just as James Baldwin writes to Angela Davis, if it's happening to them, it happens to us. It's just a matter of time. For if they take you in the morning, they will be coming for us that night. The examples of solidarity in Chicago and Wisconsin do not mean that there is agreement that the purpose of the labor movement is not just to, to bargain better contracts for its workers or, you know, just, or to struggle for a just society. There's not agreement and that in addition to the union's role in economic and labor struggle also is the union's role in the struggle for liberation. Black liberation, queer liberation, women's liberation, liberation for all. It's messy. And so when I say it, it's messy I, and I talk about um, there not being agreement amongst um, um, unions or trade unionists and, and pointing out some successful practices of working together um, with the community and Black Lives Matter and other civil rights organizations, I have to also point out what the, what the other side of that coin looks like. Some New York teachers started a petition to protest their local um, UFT organization joining a Staten Island march against the killings of Michael Brown and Eric Gardner. Some of the objecting teachers have police officers and their families. Others don't see why unions should mobilize on something that's unrelated to schools. Paraprofessional Diane um, Gatulo signed a petition calling for UFT President Michael Mugru to resign. She stated that he was dragging her unwillingly into the current racial and police issues. In St. Louis, the communications worker local 6355, President Bradley Herman, heard similar objections from white members when the union supported the protests in nearby Ferguson. Harmon said that they see coverage on the local TV about rioting and looters and they're scared. For them, he sees this as, for his local, he sees it as an organizing project that you've got to agitate, agitate people and you have to get them to listen and you have to listen to them. Meanwhile, other local, members of his local who live in Ferguson had tear gas shot at them while they were in their backyards. Black members are beside themselves, President Harmon said and they're not wrong in wanting change quickly. Leslie McSpadden, Michael Brown's mother, <coughs> excuse me, is a member of the Food and Commercial Workers Union. The union joined her calls for, fair, for a fair investigation and justice under the law, but it stopped short of denouncing the killing. In late July of 2016, a UAW, a United Auto Workers local chapter representing 13,000 workers and the University of California systematically called on the AFL to end its affiliation with the International Union of Police Associations. They denounced the union after Freddie Gray's death in the hands of, um, while in the hands of police, in, while in custody in the hands of police in Baltimore. How can there ever be solidarity between law enforcement and the working class, the union group asks, when elites call upon police and their organizations to quell mass resistance to poverty and inequality? The letter was a product of the UAW's Black Interest Coordinating Committee. It was formed in 2014 after the acquittals of the police and the deaths of Mike Brown and Eric Gardner. Some officers do care. Um, uh, people may not know, but there's an 80,000-member 80, organization entitled the National Black Police Association, the National Black Police Association, and they came out with a public statement, and it reads, 
The police killings of unarmed African American males, females, and other persons of color has reached epidemic proportions in America. And in August resolution, the National Black Police Association advocated that the Justice Department aggressively prosecute, prosecute police officers involved with the killing of unarmed persons of color. In Cleveland, Ohio, the president of Black Shield, an organization that represents black police officers in the city, called for the police union to resend its endorsement of Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. Black Shield President Lisa Hampton said the Trump endorsement, which passed by a margin of 216 to 68 votes, was deeply concerning and not at all indicative of the city's police officers. About 1,200 officers are union members. The endorsement of a presidential candidate who is reckless, who has a history of being racist, and has committed to insult people from different ethnic backgrounds and religious religions is totally unacceptable, Hammond said. She also said that she believed many Black Shield members felt too dismayed to vote and were not given a third option to vote for, or the option to vote for a no endorsement. She said she believes that if the union had offered a non-endorsement officers op option, excuse me, more officers would have voted. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? When I think about uh, what we hear in our in our communities um, throughout our states where we have affiliates, we see people who we talk to people who said they just didn't vote, they didn't care for either option, and they couldn't believe they never thought, never imagined that Trump had any real chance of winning. Many unions worry about criticism from police unions. Which, true to form, um, the police unions have objected to the, the Black Lives Matter movement. There was a, a bulletproof t-shirt, a t-shirt that said bulletproof Black Lives Matter that the police union was able to get pulled from Walmart and Amazon.com. <coughs> the reading, reason stated um, or given was that the t-shirts the would incite violence and instead encourage the, the, the stores, Amazon and Walmart, to instead share, um, sell Blue Lives Matter t-shirts. We must not accept the myth that some people are lesser than us. I think to do so dis diminishes their humanity and ours. At its root, I believe that what this fight is all about, that, that that's what this fight is all about, a diminishing of humanity. And when we think about what it takes to win, what that means for me is that we see the humanity, we honor the humanity, and we fight for the humanity in every person. What's on your screen um, right now is this um, sign-on letter to stop the shootings of black and Latino um, unarmed people. And it was um, sent out by the Left Labor Project in July of 2016. So I'm going to take a, um, another break here and see if there are any comments or questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, Tanya, there are. There's one question here, just one. Um, it says you spoke of the blocking of blacks being a part of the early unions. Are there any statistics or strategies on if any unions are doing anything to address diversity today? So, so, so I think yes. what they're asking is, yeah, are there any strategies? to what unions are doing to address diversity in unions today, I guess, to add more people of color. Mm -hmm. So I, I think everybody's familiar with the, um, the lack of organizing that's going on in our, our country, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next section. Um, I, there are 67 civil rights departments that I am aware of um, and unions, um, uh, and the unions that I'm aware of right now, and I know that those um, civil rights departments are are doing that work. In addition to that, there are um, affiliates of the AFL-CIO, such as the um, A. Philip Randolph Institute and the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. I'm going to take a drink one second.
<clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I would say, though, um, that there are also 102 unions in America, um, including those with AFL SADIO. And it's when I said earlier that this is it's, it's messy. Um, it is, and it's because um, for for a number of reasons. One, it's it's that we don't talk talk about race in in this country that it's uncomfortable, and that if you um, if your interests are not um, transparent and if you don't have a good facilitator it can go you know pretty bad pretty quickly and so I think people tend to steer away, steer away from having those types of discussions and so I would say that that's the reason why you see these different <clears throat> organizations springing up for for people of color these affinity groups if you will like this group that that sprung up um, after the police killings within the union um, there the, the um, the creation of these groups would suggest to me that the conversation is not being had within the unions or that there is some level of um, a lack of trust or uncomfort in, in wanting to, to raise the issue. Um, so there, there's definitely more that has to be done and should be done. I will give um, two examples um, that we've seen in the, the National Black Worker Center project. And both of these took place uh, um, in Los Angeles. Um, the one is a, a member who re a member who is a member of um, the IATSE Youth Union and a member of the LA Black Workers Center project who reached out to us when um, a noose noose nooses I'm not sure several noose or nooses I think it's the plural form of noose excuse me um, had been left on his workstation and he had been threatened and harassed. And he approached his union, and his union um, shrugged it off and said that, you know, don't worry about it. That's just someone playing a game. When he complained to management, um, he believes that as a result of doing that, he was not assigned um, as many of the um, um, more profitable films, or uh, big bankroll films that he had been um, assigned to previously. The second example that I want to share um, took place in the building trades. One of our uh, members went through um, a building trades apprenticeship um, program, um, did everything that he needed to do on his first day of the job. He was not allowed to um, go take a bathroom break, to get water, or to take uh, or to have um, lunch. And as a result, he passed out and was taken to the, the hospital. And he contacted his union uh, um, about it and was not successful. We contacted his union. Um, about the issue and the union told us that they don't deal with matters of race, right? And so because a lot of um, the leaders in our uh, worker centers also are previous employers of unions, we we have, uh, you know, we obtain a contract and we can, you know, push back and say, this is language in your contract, right? That you get a break, that you get water, that you get lunch, et cetera. And it's inhumane, right? And this is what we stand for. What we were able to do, we, were, we weren't um, successful with working with that level, local but we were successful in working with the Civil Rights Department of that international union to, to get some uh, recourse for that particular employee. And so I share those two examples um, with you to say that the issue of race and racism in unions is not, uh, has not gone away, that, that we're at a different point in time in our, in our history, but this, um, the, the racism still still remains, and what I'd mentioned earlier about this 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 magical thinking, if you will, of unions to say that you know we are protecting American jobs for the American workforce, and they're so and therefore pushing away these other low skilled on you know low wage employees is is foolish, and it hinders um. It hinders any success that we would have in building, um, rebuilding a sustainable labor union. And so, at the National Black Worker Center project, that's part of our our goal, right? Is to partner with unions to to encourage them to to organize um, black workers in particular, uh, women and people of color in particular. We think that um, that that is a strategy that is necessary. And I'll be honest and say that this it's it's a um, it's an uphill battle, right? There, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and what we are doing is 
starting with those organizations who have who've come around and seen the light, like the, the Chicago Teachers Union that I mentioned, like the, the AFL-CIO in, in Wisconsin, um, the, the Painters Union, right, people, unions who say that they are, in a, say and have demonstrated a willingness to, to partner and to address and to acknowledge um, the challenges that they've had within their organizations and to move beyond them. Any other questions, man? <clears throat> yes, here's one. Um, what kind of working relationship do black worker centers have with local employment attorneys who can represent them in discrimination, harassment, or retaliation cases that yeah. are not brought under the union briefings process? Yeah, that, that's a good question. When you look at um, the history of worker centers, um, that one of the, the the primary ways that they operated was to to educate and to inform immigrant workers, new workers, workers that had been shut out from traditional um, the traditional workplace on what their rights were, um, dealing with um, issues of wage theft, et cetera. Um, what we have made a conscious decision to do at the Black Worker Center is to to if you have that type of an issue where you, we to, to direct those folks to organizations that are mostly focused on that. We found that to be very um, time intensive, intensive and not um, as successful as we would like to, to, um, to be in terms of having an impact on our community. So rather than having an approach of just um, dealing with workers on an individual basis, we look at the, the advancement of black workers as a collective. So for example, um, in Washington, D.C., the Black Worker Center, the, the, um, the Black Worker Center there is entitled One D.C., and for a number of years they worked on um, issues um, regarding unemployment and low wage employment, and did a lot of work around creating training programs and apprenticeships for for people to get jobs. And what they found is that they were training people just for the sake of training them because they could not get their folks hired into any jobs. And so rather or or they would get, you know, a job here, a job there. If you know, if they got people twenty people into um, twenty jobs at if at every quarter, that was considered a success. But when we evaluated it, it truly wasn't um, the type of success that we um, want to have, nor was it the type of success that builds a movement or real power for communities of, of black people. What 1DC has um, transitioned and does now um, is to negotiate and um, establish working agreements with employers, new employers that are coming into Washington D and existing employers to say to them um, or to negotiate with them similar to um, the folks in, in the Bay Area Workers Center, um, they will identify as a number of jobs or a number of opportunities in a particular industry and say to that employer, we will train, um, do soft skills, hard skills, get this, this workforce ready for you and get a commitment from the, the employer to hire um, their workers. And then they set about just doing just that. Um, you can imagine there's a lot of negotiations involved, a lot of community benefit agreements involved, things of that nature. But our focus has been um, to shift from, um, excuse me, our focus has been to shift from individual um, employees and really look at groups of employees as, as a whole. Uh, another example I could give is in um, um, Chicago, where we are are working to um, create a similar program that DC has in, in identifying jobs that we believe should be um, at, that work, black workers should have access to. So, for example, in the south side of Chicago, there are a number of um, warehouses and just big. They look like they're abandoned buildings if you were just driving down the street. And what we found by kind of just staking out these buildings is that they aren't abandoned. And at late at night, workers are being bussed into these warehouses and they are working. And we've sent workers over to apply for jobs and been told that they can't be hired. Uh, we, we talked to the people that are being bussed in and learned that they are 
being bussed out in from outside of the city, whereas you've got um, a business operating in a neighborhood that's gotten tax benefits um, or, or tax credits, excuse me, from the city to operate there and will not hire the residents that live in that community. And so rather than have a um, take on a, um, a lawsuit for a particular um, individual or fight with the with these particular industries has been against the, the industry as a whole and against the city to say that if you're going to use our tax dollars, then you will provide our community with um, access to these jobs. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. Um, let's see, one more here was, what are some of the ways that we can be empowered and bringing race back to the labor movement conversation and our interactions with our institutional unions. So I think that the the first way that you do that is to be being active in your in your institution and in your organization and putting the discussion on the agenda um, by having so by having conversations with with black people with people of color with people that don't look with look like you and to talk to them about what has their experience been, what, uh, what are the things that concern them, um, and then raising that and with your, with your union. And I think that one of the things that we have to be cautious to do is to not raise it in a, in a, a sense of that we are merely complaining or, or griping about the problem, but raising it to say this is something that we want to struggle and grapple with together. Um, using the, the, the similar tactics that you would in, in, in any organizing drive to mobilize and organize a union, right? You want to um, introduce yourself, right, to whomever it is that you're talking to so people understand who you are and what you're coming, what your, what your purpose is and, and the, the interest that you bring to, to that conversation. You want to listen and understand what the, what the other person's perspective is, what are the challenges that they're having, and then you want to bring together or brainstorm together on what some possible solutions are. I think that a conversation that needs to be had on a daily, monthly, hourly basis is the conversation about the declining membership of the labor movement and how we cannot afford to grip tightly, you know, the in our coffers, the few thousand members that we have when there are this hundreds of thousands of other members that are waiting and eager or right to be organized. We have to be bold and we have to be fearless and we need people to to lead those those campaigns that cry and that rally. And, and as I mentioned earlier, that's why um, part of our focus is in um, the Black Workers Center not to build more members but to build more leaders. We more we need more people that are willing to to step up and to, to speak out and be vocal. I'm going to share um, uh, another story with you that kind of highlights this. I had an opportunity to travel to Johannesburg, South Africa um, last month and I was speaking on um, the similarities between uh, migrant workers in, uh, in Africa and um, black workers in the United States of America. And wherever this is, um, it was after um, obviously the Trump election and when people heard my voice, they immediately knew that I was not from Africa and I was from the United States. And I got so many condolences and, and questions asking, what in the hell happened? How did this happen um, with, with Trump being elected? The other thing that um, stood out to me is that people said, you know, that you must be prepared to, they asked the question, um, are you prepared to fight and are you prepared to die? And when you have this type of... Um, what they called um, a, a dictatorship, a spirit of dictatorship, start to um, cover and engulf your 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 country. You must people must be prepared to die, and people must be prepared to fight. And I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that you know the thing that you have to do is be prepared to to die or to fight, but it does mean right that there is sacrifice that needs to be made in order for us to to move forward and to make advancements, not just for for black people, but for our country. Um, and that means that you have to sometimes stand alone, sometimes take um, ridicule. Um, I, I think that's why um, I, I love that quote by Gandhi that was on the opening page about, um, let me see if I can 
I love this quote. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And these are the stages that we must be willing to to acknowledge and to embrace and to confront if we are going to change our labor movement and change our country. Good question. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's no more questions. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, I, I consider this, the, the, this an age of inequity. And I would say that in this age of inequity, the labor market operates poorly for most workers, especially black workers. Black work has, be, has become synonymous with low-paying, exploitative jobs. Blacks continue to face a two-dimensional job crisis that is expressed disproportionately by um, high levels of unemployment and low wage work. Strategies to address the black job crisis must focus on building power among black workers in order to address the power lopsidedness that is at this crisis's root. And in spite of this all, I would say to you all that I still have hope. I, I mentioned earlier um, that there are 102 unions in America, including those affiliated with the AFL. Um, that includes independent unions and change to win unions. There are 67 civil rights directors and departments that I'm aware of. Black workers are more likely than any other race to be unionized. Blacks are also overrepresented in the union workforce with 14.1% of union workers being black while only 11.9% of the overall workforce is black. Black union workers have wages that are 16.4% higher than their non-union counterparts. The union wage advantage is even more for black men. It's 19.3%. Black union members are also 17.4% percentage points more likely than any other not than other non-union blacks to have employer provided health insurance and 18.3% more likely to have an employer sponsored retirement plan black union workers today look much different than their predecessor, predecessors today they're more likely to be older between 45 and 60 years old they're female they're foreign born and they have more years of formal education and they work in the public sector. We hear a lot about um, immigrants in, our, in, our, in the news, but we don't hear much about um, black immigrants. Black immigrant workers have maintained a higher unionized rate than their U.S. born peers. In 2015, 16.9% of immigrant black workers were represented, were represented by unions, while 13.8% of native born blacks were represented by unions. While union density is rapidly tanking, there is a tsunami of people of color waiting, begging to be organized. And that's why the National Black Workers Center Project is launching um, next month our first national campaign. And the campaign is entitled Working While Black. Working While Black is the strategic communications and organizing campaign that's designed to, to mobilize and communicate the experiences, challenges, aspirations, and achievements of black workers. In addition to giving voice and validation to black workers, we hope and aspire to organize black workers into more worker committees, black worker centers, and most importantly, unions. In creating the Working Wild Black Campaign, we've learned that telling stories is a transformative practice. This practice opens up the door to community building. It's human to have a story, and trust is required to share one's story. People must allow themselves to be vulnerable and to face um, fear of ridicule or rejection. But it's in that vulnerability that we find our power, the power to act and to create another chapter in the story. Stories stay with us. You can't shake a good story. They cause you to wonder, to wonder, to worry, to dream. Storytelling enables us to see ourselves and our circumstances and our communities in a different light. They can motivate us to make hard decisions 
and change behavior. And I'm focusing on the, the storytelling because the first two camp, um, phases of our campaign are called Show Yourself and then Tell Your Story. And so we've got this um, social movement campaign where people are will be asked next month to start taking pictures of themselves, black people taking pictures of themselves working or wanting to work or looking for a job or having good experiences, and then tell their stories. And so similar to what you might normally do when you, you've had a bad day at work, you come home and say, girl, or you know your husband or whatever, you won't believe what happened to me today. Instead of keeping those stories inside of your home or your community, we're asking people to, to share those stories and share those images, and we believe in the sharing of those stories and images. We will build community. We have seen um, in, our, in our work at the Black Worker Center, um, I don't want to call it a phenomenon, but it, it, it's something, right, where people are, black people are embarrassed when, because of the, the racism and the discrimination that they face on their jobs, and there's a shame associated with it. There's a sense of, since um, the civil rights movement, the, the so-called success of the civil rights movement, that we should have overcome by now. And what's wrong with me that I am, that I'm not able to, to rise above my particular circumstances. And so we're asking people to be vulnerable and to make public those stories. And we believe that in making public those stories and sharing those stories with the rest of the labor community and the world, and our country at least, not the world, their country, people will see in black workers themselves. They will see the same struggles and challenges. And rather than asking people, and, and we won't stop at just asking people to share those stories and to kind of just live in, in that moment, we want people to take that anger, that frustration, that, um, that injustice and that rage and channel it into organizing their communities and organizing their workplace. And that brings us to the two, the last two phases of our campaign, which are mobilizing and organizing. Mobilizing your community around these stories, mobilizing your, your local city government, uh, mobilizing community partners. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, right, our goal, our ultimate goal is to organize our members, our black worker center members into unions. And the leadership and development that and training that we give our Black Worker Center members, our expectation is that they would take that training and leadership into their union. And to the person who asked a question about what we can do, our hope is that in doing that, we will grow and expand our unions. And, and from the inside out and from the outside in, we, 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 we cannot stay in the state. We must, we must work. And that, that's part of our, um, our strategy that we're launching. Um, next next month, and um, I want to share one other story with you, and it uh, goes back to when I first started organizing. I was my first campaign was in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, and I was working on a uh, sewing factory that called it was called Tinsley Manufacturing, and they made Girl Scout uniforms and Catholic school uniforms and things like that. And if you're familiar with the organizing drive, um, there there comes a point, right, when you, you, we call it, you know, you have to send the workers to the gate, which means that instead of you standing past out the leaflets and talking to the workers, you organize an organizing committee, and the leaders of that committee are then responsible. You have to turn it over to them. They're responsible for talking to their coworkers, and the first task that you give them, assignment that you give them, is to... Um, distribute flyers to their their co-workers announcing the fact that we're going to um, have a union at this workplace. So in this organizing committee we had 10 members and on the day that we were to that they were to pass out the flyers I went to meet them at the opening of the entrance of the, the, um, the factory and only one woman showed up. And she, hers, I will never forget her name was Claire Bam, her name was Clara and we called her baby girl and because she was really short and she was just a little petite woman. Um, and she was by herself. And she said, I don't think I can do it. I can't do it. We have to do it another day. And I pushed her um, to do it. And I couldn't go to the gate with her. She had to go by herself and she had to stand there. And the employer, Ed Tinsley, came out and cursed her and 
shouted at her and, and shoved her, but she stood her ground. And she kept passing out the flyers. And long story short, um, other people joined the following weeks. We went on to win that organizing drive. And at the end of most campaigns, when you're successful, there's always some kind of a party. And so we were having a really big party to celebrate our victory. And everyone was there. Um, people who didn't participate on the campaign, the secret people, like, I was at you all the time. I just never said anything about it. You know, everybody came out of the woodworks. And it was a great um, party, except for Clara wasn't there. And we were looking for her and wondering where she was at and calling her and didn't get an answer. Until finally later in the um, the evening, Clara showed up to the the hotel where we were having a party, and all of her stuff was packed up in her car. And we wanted to know what was going on. And Clara said that she decided that if she could stand up on her job with her union, that she could stand up in her home. And we learned that night that Clara had been um, in an abusive relationship and decided to, to stand up. And I get emotional every time I tell the story, but I, I it, it touches me. And I think that, and I know that that is part of the work that we aspire to do with the National Black Worker Center Project, to help people to stand up in their workplaces. Because we know that when you stand up in your workplace, you become fearless, and you have the ability to stand up in your home and in your community for your children and for your neighbors. And so with that, I conclude my presentation. And I can take any other comments or questions that people may have. All right. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, that was a great ending and just a great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, right now, uh, no one has any more questions as of yet. We can give them maybe, uh, yeah, we have more time. It's 420, so I don't know. We can give people maybe a couple more minutes if they have any. Um, then we can, you know, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, give people a moment to maybe they can think of a couple more questions or comments they may have. I actually have a question. I'm wondering, I'm curious about who are the people on the this call? What organizations do do they represent and what, what type of work do they do? Let's see. Uh, some of them can put in the question marks, but I can look at who it is. Let's see, we have some people from Jobs with Justice, Working Fairness, uh, AFL-CIO, some researchers and communications department. Uh, I seem like most everyone's connected to the labor movement. Mm -hmm. Most of the even names I see. Yeah, 32BJ. Yeah, Coalition of Kaiser Permanente Unions. It's a lot of people putting in where they're actually working. So, yeah, it looks like most everyone's connected to the labor movement. Mm -hmm. That's looks. good to hear. You know, Ben, the reason I asked is because of the, the question when people, um, when someone um, asks, was it that. Um, that, that they can do, and it, it's good to know that everyone is connected to to the labor movement in, in some sort of way. I think that um, that's a good entry point. It, it means that you already have a sense of who are the people that um, would most likely be able to, to make movement, who are the people that are positioned to, to organize a greater amount of a greater amount of people and to have that discussion. I would encourage um, all the folks on the on this um, on this webinar. I'm not sure why people were interested, but I can take a guess at it. And I would encourage you all to to take what you um, the interest that drew you to participate in this webinar to to do something in your community, if not within your union, within your community. I think that there's not a city or a state in this country that isn't being impacted by um, the Trump administration's um, I'm, I'm trying really hard not to curse the Trump, <laughs> the Trump's, you know, racist um, <laughs> ban on 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 anybody and everybody that does not look like him, and more so now than ever, we must come out of our silos. We cannot afford to to just um, be comfortable. Our okay. comfort um, is, is fleeting. 
If other people, if the least of us are uncomfortable, then soon we will be as well. And if that's not motivation for you, then God bless us all. Yeah. All right. True. True. Let me see. Someone actually just put in a question here. There seems to be more union-led efforts to start worker centers within their ranks, but have attracted increased attention, criticism, attacks from the business community, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. How can quote independent end quote worker centers sustain themselves in the long run, given this context? Hmm. That that's an interesting question. I can't speak to all worker centers, but I would say that the the black worker centers have not been um, supported. Um, or are founded with um, the support of, of unions. Um, they have been independently started based on a need that was seen in, in their community. So for example, the first Black Worker Center um, was started in North Carolina as the Black Workers for, for Justice, and it was um, a number of black workers who got together as a result of um, the what was going on in the manufacturing um, business, where I talked earlier about um, companies moving from the north to the south and them realizing that in the north people had unions and they had different wages and they were doing the same jobs and not getting um, getting the same wages. It's also interesting um, to point out that there is not um, consensus surprise in the labor movement um, about worker centers. There are some in some unions who are not supportive of worker centers, some unions who see worker centers as um, an all um, an alternative to to unions and feel threatened by that. So so there's there's not consensus um, around labor there as well. But where you are correct, um, I think for all worker centers, be you um, Asian, Latino, Black worker center, whatever, the business community is sorely against worker centers as much as they are against um, labor unions. And when you read their literature, they frequently talk about worker centers as just being um, unions in disguise and so for for that reason alone one I say we must be doing something right if we've gotten um, their attention and then two it really speaks to the need and necessity for worker centers and unions to partner together where unions um, have abilities that worker centers don't have the same is true for worker centers and so um, I would say that historically unions have not had a strong presence in the community where worker centers have a very strong presence in the presence and present presence in the community, and so when you're organizing a union, one of the first tactics that the company tries to use against you is say that these unions are outsiders coming in. You can't say that with the worker center because the worker center is led by people that live in that community. On the flip side of the coin, worker centers can't negotiate a car, a contract or bargain. For, for wages and wages and wa wages and raises and things of that nature, and so our partnering together just makes really good sense for for me. It, it really and it requires us to not be threatened by one another and us to be willing to to acknowledge our differences and not be limited by them. Um. Yeah, it looks like that's the last question. No other ones. And a few people have gotten off, I've noticed. So, uh, Tanya, what is the, like the contact information of people who want to get in contact with you? Sure, well, people can um, like us on Facebook, of course, and then and, um, follow us on Instagram, and um, or go to our website, which is nationalblackworkerscenters.org nationalblackworkercenters.org and email me, or email me at an extremely long email address which is twgoburn at nationalblackworkercenters.org Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to go in and we're going to end the uh, presentation. want to thank everybody for coming on and especially thank you, Tanya. This was great. Uh, Hopefully, I think we'll be talking more about you know, the upcoming LRAN conference that'll be uh, June 8th and 9th. It'll be at Howard University. The uh, deadline for proposals is coming up uh, this Friday, so hopefully we can get those in soon. Um, all right, well, I'll end it here, and uh, Tanya, I'll talk to you in a minute. I'm looking Thanks, forward everybody. to it. Thank you for having me.